I have said this once and I'll say it again. Many of you may not believe me, which that is okay. Even though you don't believe it or believe in these stories, it will still entertain you in some way, some shape, some form. Which brings me to my next story. I was 10 years old at the time. Fifth grade year. My parents decided to stop living in town because the landlords were just constantly screwing us over. We, we would pay rent on time, but then there would be somebody else who would give them a better deal. And we'd be forced out of our home. My dad asked the landlord to give us a little bit more time. So he did. And then my dad found a country home. We got to take a look at it when it was time to go see the place. We all walked inside and the first thing I felt was something weird. Something was off. Something didn't feel right about this place. Couldn't put my finger on it. Shrugged it off like it was nothing. Just, I thought it was just trying to get adjusted to a new environment. And that's what I believed. It's just getting adjusted to a new environment. Plus, I was a little grossed out when I saw dead spiders in the window in the kitchen. Brown recluses, black widows, and your average garden spider. I took a tour around the house, the inside. I walked into the bathroom, there was a snake skin on the ground. And I'm like, ugh, why? I looked at my dad, can we just go back in the town? I miss it there. My dad goes, no, this is our home now. And I'm like, really? He said, yeah, this is our home now. In fact, we're moving in today. My dad, I can't. There's just something off about this place. And he goes, well, it's just you trying to get used to the new environment around you. You're used to the town life. Now you need to get used to the country life. You'll see, it's much better, I, I promise. You'll have a better life out here. Fine. Dad, a boy. Fast as spirit, son. So we went back to town, grabbed all of our belongings, and moved out of the out of our previous home into the, our new country home. It was in the middle of fall. It took us three to four hours tops to get everything unpacked into this new house. Back then, the outside looked nice. The inside looked different, but it was still nice and real homey. But I still wasn't used to it. There's still that off feeling, and I couldn't fathom what it was. Well, as soon as everything was unpacked and everybody had their certain place in their certain rooms. I'd walk to my room, and I'd sit down and just stare at the ground. But Dad walks by and goes, What's wrong? Dad, I just can't shake this feeling that there is something off about this place. He smiles and he kneels down next to me and goes, Son, some places are just scary to kids. We had no choice to move out of the place we lived in. Besides, we won't move again, I promise. Because me and your mom bought the property. It's ours. I smiled. I said, so this is our legit place? No more moving? Yeah, it is, son. Enjoy it. Go outside. Explore. You don't have to be inside at a certain time anymore, like you do in town. You can walk wherever you want and not get in trouble. Unless there's private property posted. Don't, don't walk on that. You get what I mean? I said, yeah. Just go outside and have some fun. And remember, it's a weekend. We moved out on Friday. You need to go outside and enjoy yourself and be a kid. It was around 5 p.m. It was already dark. And I thought to myself, what to do, what to do, what to do. I was a brave little shit back then. But after what I encountered, I started to get real careful, per se, on where I go at certain times. Here's a little backstory. I always told my dad, there's a pure, moonlight-looking woman looking at me. Did not know who it was. I can tell you right now, that was Brittany the whole time. But this one was a different experience, but not with Brittany. No, no, it wasn't. Because she was my, what my dad called, imaginary friend. But let me emphasize on that. She's not really invisible. My dad just doesn't believe in that stuff. My fiance, Victoria, I can tell you that she saw her too. Now, back to the story. My first place to go to was the silo. I smiled and I was humming happily, doing my own little dance on the way there. I looked inside. I'm like, ooh, this place is big. This place is big. I laughed. I kept laughing because it was funny because it kept echoing. To me, that was funny. And then I got a response. I went dead quiet and I walked away. And I heard it again. Hello? My heart was beating out of its chest. My blood went cold. The color left my face. And I heard it again. I can see you. I was frozen. I couldn't move. I was shaking violently. And now this fucking silo hole was a hand. It had cuts on it. This thing started to climb out of the silo. I saw more cuts. I still stood there frozen, solid. Her breathing was... <laughs> 
and I was panicking at this point. This thing came out of the silo. I heard bones cracking. I heard its jaw snap very loudly. What made matters worse? I looked up into its eyes, and its eyes were yellow. Its head was twitching like it was demonically possessed. It had this crooked smile. Come here, little boy. I'm not gonna hurt you. I promise. All you need to do is take my hand. Being ten years old, I kept looking up at him. I'm like, my dad told me not to talk to strangers. You're a stranger. I don't know you. You don't leave me alone. I'm going to tell my dad. This thing did not like hearing this. It grew very agitated. It slammed its fist into the silo, which made me jump. He said, I don't like that kind of tone from you, little boy. Little boys like you go to hell. And you know what I do to little boys down there? His voice changed, which made me more afraid. I said no. I kill little boys. You never know when you're gonna die. You are on my property, and I want you to leave now before I take you up to the sun. I bolted. I was done. As soon as he had that many voices come out of him, I bolted and I ran. And he was laughing, following me. I ran as fast as my little legs could. Kept looking over my shoulder. He was still right behind me. And I screamed and then my dad comes outside. He goes, what? 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 What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? And I pointed at the silo and I was crying. I'm like, dad, 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 dad. He's out there. He's gonna kill me. He goes, who's gonna kill you? The man. The thing. I don't know. He goes, settle down, son. What's wrong? I went to the silo. Yeah. And I saw this thing come out. Yeah. And he he said he was gonna take me to hell and he was going to torture me down there. My dad rose his brow and he goes, Come inside. He took me inside. I felt safe around my dad. My dad was an awesome man. And he grabbed his shotgun, loaded it, and he goes, Take me to where you saw this. I'm like, no, I don't wanna go back out there. He goes, Son, you need to show me. I'm like, Dad, I really don't want to go out there. And he goes, Son, you'll be safe with me. I promise I won't let anything happen to you. So we walked outside. His gun was fully cocked and ready to go. We walked to the silo together. And I was holding his hand. I was scared. And he shined his light inside. They did a thorough investigation. And he looks at me and goes, Son, I'm not going to say you're imagining things, but I don't see no footprints or any sign of anybody being in here. Come on, let's go inside. I think you've had enough fun for it. Day. He held out his arms and I jumped in his arms and we walked back inside. But here's the creepy thing. My head was buried in my dad's shoulder but my eyes could see behind him. And I saw this thing moving around, smiling at me, waving goodbye. And I just cried in my dad's shoulder until we walked inside. You guys to make you feel better? I'll lock the door for you. He locked the screen door and the main door. And he took me to my room, laid me in my bed, tucked me in read me a story and I went to sleep. That was my very, 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 very first encounter of something supernatural. This story takes place on December 23rd, two days before Christmas. My parents were getting ready for the holiday. Us as Gildalands were very late whenever it came to these holidays. My mom did her last minute shopping. We knew Santa wasn't real, but it was just the little knickknacks that brought us holiday cheer and the sense of being together as a family. We never felt so close. I was in charge of the lights. My brothers were in charge of the stockings. My older sisters were in charge of the eggnog. My youngest sisters were just there for entertainment, laughing and running around, free and wild. After I got done hanging up the lights, I asked my mom and dad if I can go outside. We still lived in the country. My dad looks at me and goes, you don't have to ask to go outside. It's the country. Not like when we lived in town where you had to ask. To make this background story, I didn't move into the country until I was a fifth grader. From fifth grade on graduation, I lived in the country. Now back to the story. As my dad told me that I didn't have to ask to go outside, I excitedly put on my cap, my coat, my boots, and when I walked outside, it was still snowing. My vision out there was very slim. All I could see was the falling snow as it made its way from the sky to the earth walked around my favorite hangout, which was the boxcar. Made my own little fire out there. And I would stay out there for hours, just staring into the fire as it danced. Something about fire still to this day makes me just watch as they dance and crackle. At 5 p.m., it dropped 
from 32 degrees to 19 degrees because it was approaching nightfall. Then I was running low on wood, took one step out of the boxcar and started to make my way to the house. As I was walking, there was footsteps behind me. I stopped and I listened. I turned around slowly and I gazed my eyes upon this pale looking female. I looked like she was in her early 20s to late 20s. Trying to be friendly, I said, hi. Her response was, hello. And I said, my name is Beth and I was interrupted with, I know who you are. I said, okay, you're, you're really starting to creep me out. What is your name? My name is not important for now. But one day, when you're 14, you will encounter me when you least expect it. I took a closer look as I approached closer, and I looked into her eyes. They were as black as death. I wasn't frightened for some reason. I said, what are you? She said, you will never know till the time comes. You need to be careful with burning fire in such a rotted wooded area. I said, oh, why is that? It'd be a shame to see a young preteen burn alive in his favorite hangout. I have been watching you since you were young. When you go to the playgrounds, when you were a little boy, I was there. Watching you grow up to be this preteen that you are, soon to be graduating 8th grade. Moving on to your high school life where you start your puberty. That's where we will meet. For now, enjoy what you have. For the time being, I can tell in the near future, you and I will have problems. As an innocent 13 year old, I laughed and I said, I don't think we'll have problems. You seem pretty nice. She laughed. She goes, that's sweet, but you don't understand. Now go. Go back to your family and never speak of this still not understanding i smiled and i said okay i took two steps forward because by the way my name is Brittany. i said nice to meet you Brittany. glad somebody was there to watch over me growing up she laughed and she goes you will one day think otherwise i'll cherish this moment for in my eyes you're still a little boy i said i'm not no boy i'm a man because like i said things will change quit arguing and go back to your family and enjoy christmas and don't think about following me but well, there will be things that will scare you because you'll be entering my realm. And I don't take too kindly to people following me in my realm, which was the forest behind the boxcar. I walked inside with a smile on my face, started to watch TV, and went to bed. That was my first encounter with Brittany without knowing it until a year later. This story takes place when I was 16, April 3rd, 2010. Two years after I was supposedly bitten by Brittany, I was angry all the time. I had violent outbursts towards my siblings. But I loved my dogs that were my best friends. I walked outside with my two dogs. They were both brother and sister. They followed me everywhere I went, inside the house and outside. Both these dogs had their own personality that I loved so much. One of them was so loving and hyper and funny. The other one was territorial but sweet. There was a letter that was in front of the door. My dad picks it up and he goes, Matt, it's for you. I opened it up, looked at the letter, and it said, For your eyes only, Matthew, you are to meet me in front of the boxcar by 12 a.m. tonight. It is that time. Signed, Brittany. I was still on edge, so I was pacing back and forth rereading the letter over and over and over and over, asking what the fuck does she mean by it's time. First thought was if she thinks it's time for me to walk away from my family, she has another thing coming. I don't up and leave my family. Or the other thought, she thinks I'm gonna end up killing somebody or hurting somebody innocent. She has another thing coming. I don't have it in me to hurt somebody innocent. I couldn't puzzle in what it was about. I ate dinner with my family and held conversations with them perfectly. But with that thought on my mind of what the hell she fucking means by its time. When it was time to go, when it finally reached 12, still getting ahead of myself. I did my homework, but I couldn't focus on my homework because I couldn't get that on my mind. What the hell does she mean that? It's time. Well, I, I finished it, put it in my backpack, got my clothes around for tomorrow. Parents said, it's time for bed. God, he's got school tomorrow. Oh, I crawled in my bed and pretended I was asleep. By the time we reached 12, everybody was quiet and asleep. I got up and put my shorts on, grabbed my gun, loaded it, taped the knife around it. My two dogs got up and they followed me outside. Down those two steps, once my foot hit the ground, I headed straight to the boxcar. Once I arrived there, nobody was around. And in a quick blink of an eye, she appeared right beside me, smiling. My dogs were growling. They did not like her. 
And she didn't appear alone. There is more of them, more of her kind. Her cold dead eyes met with my dark hazel eyes. And I said, now can you tell me what the fuck you mean by it's time? She laughed and she goes, I knew that would drive you crazy throughout the day. And what I mean by that, it's time to be sovereign to me. I did not know what that meant. Oh, can you English for me, please? She goes, yes. As of right now, you are my apprentice. You need to get down on your knees and swear your allegiance to me. In other words, your loyalty. And you'll serve no one else but me. I did not like hearing that. I stayed quiet. She goes, Matthew, it's time. I don't have a lot of time right now to be dealing with this. You told me two years ago that you were a vampire and I proved you wrong. Now you are one. I said, how do I know that? I felt the stinging sensation in my neck, but mm, my uh, culprit was nowhere to be found and didn't contact me until two years later. She goes, well, I had to give you time to develop now, didn't I? I said, develop? I don't even have the vampiric abilities to dash, to run, to move to and fro. She looks at my dogs and she goes, what an ugly pair of creatures you have. I said, those are my dogs. And I'd really appreciate it if you don't insult them. They have feelings, just like I do. She goes, that also means your family would be worthless. I looked at her and I said, and if I choose not to be sovereign to you, you will regret that decision as soon as you say it. I will start with something you love so dear and I will crush it before your eyes, making everything you love and destroying it one by one. I don't like threats. Never have I ever liked threats. I gave her this angry look and I gritted my teeth, grinding them together. And she goes, now I need a decision, Matthew. You're wasting my time. And then she yells, are you gonna be loyal to me or not? I snap. I said, no, go to hell. At that time, her eyes started to change. I went to point my rifle at her, knocked it out of my hands. It kicked me across the yard. My dogs ran toward me and I ran into the house with my dogs and I heard this isn't over. You just declared war on me, Matthew, and you will pay. Whenever she did kick me across the yard, I didn't mean like legitimately across the yard. When she kicked me, they hit me in the freaking face. And I flew for two feet in the air because it was such a hard kick. It was fast and I wasn't expecting it. When I hit the ground, I started to spit up my own blood. Me and my dogs ran inside. Two weeks go by. After that incident, I'm getting ahead of myself. Three days go by. I went to go let my dogs out. And I waited for hours and they didn't come back. A week goes by. I start to feel sad. I look at their empty beds and I try hard not to cry. I went out every day calling their names. Putting out fresh food. Dumping out old. You could tell they didn't touch it. They didn't come back. Two weeks go by. And I said, fuck it. I'm gonna go look. I looked in the front yard calling their names. I looked in the backyard calling their names. I walked to the front of the yard and I walked toward the foresty area. Once I hit that forest, I was greeted with this god-awful smell. I followed it and there they were, fur everywhere. I will spare you the rest. I broke down and cried. I cried so hard. I thought my heart was gonna break because here are my two best friends on the ground, their life taken from them. From behind me, I heard laughter. There that bitch stood laughing at me she spat out i told you i will take something you love so much and destroy it and you tell me if this rings a bell in the near future you and i will have problems back then i didn't understand i looked at her and i said what the fuck you talking about we do have problems now you just declared war on me and i'll not rest until you're fucking dead You'll pay for what you've done to my best friends. Like you took something that I love and I cherish so much. I'll take something you love. You love and cherish so much. And I'll see the look on your fucking face. And I'll look at you and I'll laugh as you're grieving. I got up, pulled my pocket knife out and I ran at her. I was stopped by two of her fucking guards. And they looked at me and they said, Do you really want a bloodbath? and start meeting on the field. That field over there, you'll meet us at the Tree of No Return, and we will battle it out. And I said, in a deep, deep voice, it felt as if my voice was demonic. I will not stop. Even if it takes many years, I will not stop until her fucking head is on a stick. Get this bitch out of my sight before I kill you both. She looks at me and she said, I'll meet you on the battlefield, you mutt which that will come relevant later. Went back to the house, grabbed the wheelbarrow, placed my dogs on 
the wheelbarrow. Brought them back to the house. Crying my eyes out, my dad looks at me, carrying this wheelbarrow, sobbing. He walks over and he goes, oh no, what happened? I didn't tell him the truth. And I cried my eyes out and he hugged me. He goes, I'll help you. We both buried my two best friends. And now they are gone. They've been gone for quite some time now. That's what started the, the most bloodiest battles that had started whenever I was fairly young. And when it stopped, I was 19. 19 years old. And she still fucking lives. I'm still on the hunt for her. My eyes are still filled with rage from all that she's took from me. I don't forget so easily. And I don't let go of grudges or rage. That concludes this story.